going to be Al Cardillo. I once again want to thank our sponsors who've made this presentation possible, Quantic Bank, NYSARC Trust Services, Advisors Insurance Brokers, and Beacon Communities that we just heard from. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Al Cardillo. And Al is the Executive Director and CEO of the Home Care Association of New York State. Al has been a part of the long-term care world in New York for many, many years. He'll tell you how many. And he is going to talk to us about what is going on in the home care world from the association provider perspective. Al. Thank you, Lou, uh, Beth, and uh, Bruce, uh, and uh, congratulations on this major conversion <laughs> to this uh, to this uh, conference format. Uh, I know you've worked so hard, and and every year these conferences are just wonderful. I also want to extend a welcome to all those who are viewing the conference today, uh, and um, look forward to our interaction as we go through the panel. Um, so this certainly is an incredibly challenging time really for home care and really the entire healthcare field and certainly society at large. Uh, you know, COVID has really made this a time like no other. Um, and, uh, and, and very apropos uh, in our overall discussion today about how individuals who are elderly or who depend on services are really affected by the confluence of all these different factors. Uh, I'm the table setter in the conversation today, so uh, I'll be doing a, a bit of an overview of, of the field and where it stands. Um, Starting with an overview of the structure of home care in New York State, I'm sure that there are experts in home care uh, uh, participating in this conference, and, and, and maybe for, for all of you, it's a bit of a reminder, but for others that um, haven't really uh, looked at the structure in a while, it's a bit, it's a bit like going over blocking and tackling you know, fundamentals uh, uh, to have a grasp of that to understand the full breadth of what's happening in the field. We'll also talk, do a, a profile and update of agencies and patients and services by the numbers, uh, review the current uh, fiscal state of the sector, which really I think is another item important in setting the stage for the challenges and then looking at what's ahead. So, you know, I, I mentioned for a moment uh, COVID, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's impossible to talk about the current state of affairs in the field without talking about the impact of COVID. Uh, you know, this has had a major uh, impact on, on agencies as they've worked to try to address issues of fear in the home, uh, reduced workforce, uh, 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 cost overruns and trying to put together a, a PPE sufficient for staff and for patient safety, uh, and dealing with a myriad of regulatory and operational issues to make care happen. I know this is a challenge in every setting, but when you're working in the community, every home is your individual setting and you're navigating across communication patterns and factors that go well 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 beyond what are in the confines and typically within the control of a facility so um it, it is an enormous challenge uh you know the i really need to do a shout out to all the home care agencies and frontline personnel who are really doing heroic work in this effort So in, in terms of looking at the structure of the system, so, you know, this slide really lists out, uh, you know, the, the major components. You know, we can probably double uh, the volume of what you see on this slide when we go into all the ancillary and allied support services. But in terms of our basic structure, we have certified home health agencies, which are the direct lines to Medicare and Medicaid participation licensed home care agencies which uh, uh, you know contract with certified agencies or manage long-term care plans or provide services directly uh, and you can see the numbers there of the agencies in the state consumer directed personal assistance program which is in every county of new york state managed long-term care plans also covering uh, uh, all of new york state waiver programs spe specifically nursing home transition transition and diversion uh, waiver um, uh, traumatic brain injury care at home um, and services under the uh, office of people with uh, uh, dis developmental disabilities uh, in addition um, the expanded in-home services for the elderly program which is a non-medicaid model really differentiated from all the others um, that is in, in every county of the state. 
Uh, this this slide, which you know, it, it, it's not easy for you to read on your screens, but I think if you, you print it, when you print it, you'll be able to see it. The real uh, uh, message of this slide is that home care really crosses the entire continuum of need. While typically we talk about home care in terms of either post-acute services or long-term care, it really it really addresses the full range of ages and needs from new moms and infants to you know, centarians. So it's it's that broad perspective. And and I and and I want to kind of emphasize that point because I think as we talk about the future of the healthcare system, we really need to speak less about whether a person is a home care patient, a primary care patient, someone in a nursing home. It's really the person. And all of the resources, all of the sectors uh, really are, uh, their charge is really to work together to provide that individual what they need when they need it. So in turn, looking at the patients, so you, know, you can see the volume of patients. Uh, looking at this slide, approximately 800,000 individuals. Most of them are duly Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, and uh, I think the MRT was using a figure closer to 900,000 in their recent reform discussion. So a huge volume of individuals across the state uh, it being served. Um, home care encompasses that broad continuum that I just mentioned. And in terms of services, uh, we, we know the preponderance of services are, are in the in-home personal support level, but it's important to really recognize the full breadth of services from skilled nursing to home health aid, physical therapy, social work, OT, PT, telehealth, uh, and then the array of other supportive services, whether they're home modifications, meals, or other allied services. When we talk about home care, we're talking about that full package. In terms of the payers, and I know this is this will be an important point that, that Lou will, will want to emphasize in this discussion and that we all need to focus on. Look, the dominant payers, whether it's certified agency services or, 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 or licensed agency services, are really Medicare and Medicaid, with Medicaid being predominantly the long-term care payer um, and Medicare weighing in more when an individual goes through different episodes of skilled need, et cetera. The private and commercial side is less than 5%. We need to do something about that if we're ever really going to have a mainstream program, uh, or we need to open up Medicare or Medicaid in different ways. But this also highlights the impact of federal and state budget actions when they're taken toward the system. These slides are next going to be pictorial and statistical, but I can be a, a brief if we just focus on the, the, the pictorial trends. I mean, you only need to look at that to see that 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 uh, in the status of the field, there's a growing need for demand, really uh, 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 in, in, in major part because of the changes in our demographics, but also the changes in how we care for people when they have needs. Um, this slide shows you the... Um, this slide shows you the, the number of people working in the field. Uh, these are again, they're approximates, they're really not for citation, but if you look at it, you have over 200,000 home health aides, personal care aides, and that doesn't count for personal assistance that would be uh, working in the, in the consumer directed program. Uh, you, you see uh, the breakdown of nursing, PT, OT, speech, uh, and that really comes into play uh, even further. When we look at that as the base, but then the projections on the number that are needed uh, by the number of positions that will actually grow in the field. This is this is the number one growing field uh, within the, within the healthcare industry in terms of positions, whether it's in New York or otherwise. But the challenge is, are you able to recruit? Are you able to to properly compensate? Uh, so when you look at this slide, this shows you uh, the average percentage of unfilled positions in home care agencies in the state. You know, you're talking about anywhere from, you know, one fifth uh, to over 10 percent on the on the therapist on the therapist lines. And this is only unfilled positions. This doesn't really relate to how many positions would you need to actually meet need. In this next slide, you see the financial state of the industry. So when you're considering as a challenge the workforce and the population challenge, what you see here then is the is the percentage uh, percentages of deficit in agencies, uh, home care agencies, uh, so certified agencies, licensed agencies, hospices, and managed long-term care plans, all predominantly in a negative fiscal position. Uh, so when we talk about challenges and we talk about needs, whether they're COVID or whether they are um, whether they are for the broader charge to this system, that you you see a situation of of you know growing demand, 
uh, workforce uh, challenge in terms of trying to fill numbers that are needed, fiscal uh, uh, adverse margins across the line, and now let's look at what's immediately ahead. And I'll, I'll try just to go two minutes and because I don't want to overrun my time. So uh, I won't go into detail here because the other speakers will be talking about these changes in greater detail. But the state budget that was recently adopted um, and, and now faces probably you know, another $10 billion in further cuts and actions, featured 2.2 billion and 4.4 billion gross Medicaid actions, and most of those were directed toward home and community-based uh, providers, managed long-term care plans, CDPAP, the long-term care structure. You know, uh, yesterday, uh, 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 across the board, rate cuts were announced at 1.5%. Uh, those are, are authorized in perpetuity. So whatever you're paid, it gets reduced. Uh, there, are going, there are going to be 3% withholds on the payments to plans, uh, managed long-term care plans. So that puts another uh, uh, impact on cash availability to be able to compensate providers for services and certainly workers for their services. There's going to be uh, uh, efforts taken to increase, this is begin, starting this October, the, the, out, the eligibility for services where an individual will have to have two or over two uh, uh, deficits in activities of daily living. We don't know what that means, but certainly there's a concern about what that threshold means. And if you don't qualify, where does that leave you? Um, uh, the, there, there's, there will be initiatives that uh, are seeking to consolidate the number and model of managed long-term care plans, and that will seek to consolidate the total number of licensed agencies in the state. A look to move to fully integrated plans, uh, constraints on the consumer directed program, which I, I, I'm sure um, will, be, will be discussed by Elizabeth uh, in the program, uh, a move to task-based assessment, uh, so that so that looking at the specific tasks that a person needs and trying to align care uh, to those tasks. And I just want to make one comment about that before I leave the slide, the, an imposition of a look back to home care and other matters. Just want to pick out two quick issues on this slide. One is an independent assessor and the other is task-based assessment. They sound like they're very reasonable. You should have a conflict-free assessor and you should have an assessment that looks at tasks. However, if you're, trying to, if you're trying to move forward with an integrated model of care, where you've integrated the, the care coordination, the services, the assessment, and they're all to revolve around the individual, I will tell you that based on my 40 years of experience, an independent assessor is in conflict with a model like that. I have great concerns about where that's going and how that will be shaped and how that will impact impact the clinical delivery of services. Task-based assessment, it's fine to focus on tasks, but if we stop focusing on the whole person and the services that that person needs and the professionalization of what's delivered, I think we start to lose an important component of the system. About one two minute. minutes now. Thank you. I'll just do one minute on this last slide. Thank you, Lou. Uh, so, so in terms of looking at what's ahead, for home care, um, first of all, you know, is the clear significant growing need and demand there'll be for this field, not only by the demographics, but because the changes in how we want to run the hospital system, the nursing home system, and other services around really demand a realignment of services focusing on the ability to provide community care. In terms of finance, the chart I showed shows the inadequacy of financing in home care. You can bet that that also ha occurs in nursing home care, and we need to figure out a way for there to be viability in finance. But we also have to figure out finance and in, in, in models for finance that are sustainable. That goes to the next item, which is really in, in terms of trying to mainstream the coverage for the services that, that are within the home care system. If it's always a Medicare or Medicaid equation, it's always going to be curbsided in all sorts of budget decisions and, and other finance decisions. Workforce development, that not only means supply, but it means to, uh, uh, to properly support uh, and promote the quality of individuals who are providing care at home and to support those individuals on a human level who provide those critically needed services. Technology and innovation, we're discovering certainly in COVID, the, the increased valued role of technology and efficiency uh, and quality for patients. Um, and uh, I won't go into the other lines only because I don't want to run over time, but, but those are also critical elements, uh, uh, you know, the quality and innovation, uh, 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 providing services that are clearly customer and patient-centered and regu a regulatory uh, body uh, structure that really matches 
the 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 um, the needs to deliver services within the system. So I, I, again, uh, I we'll we'll wind we'll conclude with that, and we'll be available for questions when we convene the panel. Al, that was a masterful presentation and an enormous amount of information. Uh, we could talk about this for hours, and we did once about a month ago. On April 25th, Al was on our radio show. If you don't know, we do a radio show every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. on WGY. It's called Life Happens, Are You Prepared? And on April 25th, Al was on talking about the home care challenges and, and how home health agencies, and those numbers, Al, are startling in terms of the percentages and the revenues and the way that these agencies are struggling and, it, and it's not there's no real bright light on the horizon is there well i think what you know just kind of going to your point lou when when you look at the financial position that's outlined in those slides and then you consider uh, uh over two billion dollars of more cuts and actions coming and further things to suppress the system um, that really creates quite a dilemma. We're very concerned as an association of where things are going, but I think we all have to prepare with our own innovation and creative ideas for the best ways to bridge that. And I know some of the ideas that you have related to finance uh, and yeah. the need to change the finance structure are right on target. And technology. Don't forget the technology angle because that really has to become part of the care plan where, where we have such a shortage of labor. We need to be able to bolster that labor with a technology platform that works for people in their homes. And, and I think it, I think with that too, it's it's very important that that while there is the you know the, the focus on efficiency and efficiency always works its way into price, we have to remember who it is that's providing these services and whether it's nurses or therapists or the particularly the home health aides. Uh, uh, those are the vital people around which the system turns. And if one is going to invest. Uh, properly in our system and our society, that investment has to be made in those people. So with that, let's transition. Thank you, Al, again. And, we, and I have a thousand questions for you. If you have questions for Al, and I hope you do, and I'm sure you do, remember, you can put them in the chat on the right side of your screen, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. Right now, I'd like to bring on Nora Barato. Uh, Nora and I have been working together unofficially for about 25 years from her days at St. Peter's Hospital and more formally for about two years when she came on and started assisting with a, a project that we had then called Everhome Care Advisors. And now Nora is the Director of Client Services at Everhome Care Advisors. And I learned the value of care management and care coordination on a private basis with my mom who had Alzheimer's. And I think that that value plays out now more and more every day for people who are trying to navigate through this maze and out did set the stage very well. Nora, take it away and let's hear it. Thank you, Lou. I'm really uh, excited to be here and participating again. And uh, I do have to give a shout out to Lou right off the top because he has been an advocate, an avid um, advocate for elders and for um, aging life care coordinators. And it happens to be um, May is Aging Life Care Coordinators Month, and it's also Older American Month. So um, I really do thank uh, Lou uh, for you know his advocacy and for providing this presentation um, year after year for uh, the elder work, elder care community. So thank you. Um, I'm here to talk about the uh, Medicaid eligibility and access. Um, to home care services and the the the, the budget cuts, and um, I think it's very um, fitting to start out first with this caregiving snapshot. Um, this is provided the the AARP Family Caregiving and the Alliance for Caregivers um, provided a nice infographic on the snapshot of caregiving and they compared it from uh, 2015 to 20 and, and the statistics for 2020. And I have to say, it really caught my eye. I've been in the field for years. And what I've seen over and over again is the increasing stress on caregivers. And um, for those of you who have been a caregiver, it's not for the faint hearted. It's very difficult. You have to learn to be an expert in all areas. And um, the fact that 23% of Americans say caregiving has made their health worse is something that um, 
we as aging care providers really have to look at. Um, the stress level is tremendous. And with Al, uh, Al talking about thinking about continuum, um, that's really important because our role as aging care uh, advocates is to help make those transitions across the continuum to be very smooth. And um, I can say it is very, very rough and it's very fragmented, very complex, and that is exhausting to a caregiver. Um, I'm sorry, I went ahead. <laughs> um, New York State proposed uh, changes. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with working in um, uh, the arena, there's two types of um, you know, Medicaid focused on um, the nursing home side, which has a five-year look back. And now um, the um, programs that I'm gonna discuss are on the community care Medicaid side. But now one of the proposed changes is uh, that there's going to be a look back of two and a half years um, and there's uh, non-exempt assets. So looking at that, um, examples are um, money that's been gifted to a grandchild or to a child, um, vehicles sold within a family member um, that are half of that, um, half of the uh, value. Those are things that are really gonna impact. And if it's one thing I can say, um, families aren't thinking that way. They're in the midst of caregiving. They're not thinking about um, what happened 30 months ago and um, keeping track and keeping records. So uh, that's gonna be a very overwhelming to caregivers, trying to collect data and, and um, all their information in that. I had a recent experience with uh, my own family member who's in a crisis and we're trying to get the documents together and in a point of crisis that is just um, excruciating. So this is something that is really concerning to me is even that first attempt to start gathering documents. I already talked about that, so I'm gonna move on. Okay, so what is this gonna impact? The programs um, are, that are impacted are managed long-term care, uh, the personal care services, consumer directed um, uh, program, private duty nurses, nursing home uh, transition and diversion program, and assisted living programs. Let's talk about what is covered, um, home care aids. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, but I, I wanted to just make sure that people know um, the different levels of care and, and examples of job duties. Um, you know, the personal care we, we all know spends um, their time shopping and homemaking, doing the bathing, running errands. Um, the home health aid is a more of a little bit complex level where it's more focused on um, toileting and um, bathing and dressing, as well as wound dress dressings. And then nursing, um, you know, they do the monitoring of the vital signs and um, ordering DME and observing changes in condition. Okay, so changes to medical eligibility. Um, effective October 1st, 2020, the personal care and CDAP, uh, C CDPAP, services will require the need for uh, assistance with three activities of daily living, um, or they need to have a diagnosis of dementia. Um, they must be prescribed by an independent physician under contract with DOH and approved by an independent assessor under contract with DOH um, instead of the local Medicaid and managed long-term care program. This is extremely concerning to me because who knows that older adult and family and what is going on with their health condition um, better than the primary care physician. Um, and uh, an independent physician may not have the specialization and the expertise in terms of 
certain diagnoses. Um, so that is really concerning. Um, also, uh, that whole process, what's that gonna look like um, trying to get that independent um, assessment? Um, for enrollment into the managed long-term care programs, um, they must meet the need for physical maneuvering with more than two ADLs. Um, physical maneuvering, that's a definition. I'd like to see what they mean by that um, because it's all in the interpretation. And, uh, you know, in my experience with looking at uh, assessments in that and having to go through the Maximus assessments, time and time again, there's conflict with um, what is um, clients say that they need help in and what they actually need help in. Um, it's all in the perception. And sometimes um, we say, well, we got to listen to the client, but that's not always an accurate picture, especially if someone has um, dementia or, you know, they're concerned that, you know, they don't want to have the help in the house and they're looking for families to um, continue to do that care in which they really can't. Um, for persons with dementia and Alzheimer's diagnosis, they must need um, supervision with one or more ADL. I can't tell you how many times I go into a house and it's not that they need the assistance, it's the constant verbal cueing because they have such poor retention and cognition. And um, that is a piece that is uh, very concerning to me um, because a lot of Alzheimer's patients um, or dementia patients, they can do um, the task, but it's the frequent verbal cueing and reminders. Two more minutes. They, okay, that they need along the way. The other thing is it eliminates housekeeping level one services now authorized by uh, the local districts up to eight hours a week. The treating physician can help, as I mentioned before, um, the independent physician. Um, that's really a concerning issue. This requirement um, is really gonna add delays to the services uh, because they don't have the medical history information and that turnaround time is slow at best. Uh, it's improving, but um, it's still very um, uh, fragmented depending on the amount of physicians involved. The new assessment tool, Al talked about this um, evidence-based tool to make appropriate and individualized determinations. Um, I'd like to see that tool. It's due to come out um, you know, April 1st, 19, 2021, boy, I'm going backwards. <laughs> Department of Health is gonna replace the new function now performed by local districts. Um, and that's likely gonna be that independent assessor is likely gonna be Maximus. Um, and in determining how much care um, is to be authorized. Potential impact on home care changes. Um, the demand for home care continues to grow um, even while these program components are being scaled back. The continued workforce shortages. I have to tell you, the greatest thing that I see with the um, uh, pandemic is the increased and almost forced use of technology because we at Ever Home Care Advisors have been using technology and it does work and it is useful for the home health aides to report and communicate um, to the physician and to us as case managers. Um, and I'm really excited to see more focus on that, but they've got to look at technology from the ground up instead of it being driven by the healthcare uh, industry. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned, the, the caregiver frustration is going to result in families giving up and if they give up and they can't do it anymore, then guess what? They're gonna to come to the emergency rooms. They're gonna get relief any way that they can. Um, so with that, um, I would like to just say that I think that at Ever Home Care Advisors, uh, we go across that continuum and all levels of care 
And that is really an important focus as we move forward with all of these changes, that we all work together so that we can make it easier for caregivers and older adults. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Uh, the Medicaid changes are dramatic. We, Nora and I did a webinar on those changes, which is available on our website, purolaw.com. You can also get Al's uh, Life Happens radio appearance from April 25th, and in fact, Dan Heim's radio appearance from May 16th at purolaw.com. There's my commercial. So thanks, Nora, and we'll be back with questions for you um, at the end of the program as well. I'd like to now bring on Elizabeth Martin, who is the CEO of Consumer Directed Assistance Programs. And I've been working with Elizabeth as well for a number of years. She's been part of this program in the past. Hello, Elizabeth. No. And CDPAP in, in our world in upstate New York plays such a large role for those clients needing Medicaid. Elizabeth, tell us about it and where we stand. Great, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, event. I love coming to it every single year. Um, I love it in person. This is awkward <laughs> doing it by web, but uh, we'll make do with what we have. So um, yeah, I'm, I don't, I want to assume, I don't want to assume that everybody knows who I am or what consumer directed personal assistance is or consumer directed choices. So I just want to real quick recap on everything. Um, CD Choices is a nonprofit based in Albany, New York, and we exist essentially to create a world where people with disabilities can live in total freedom. That's what we do. And we do that by being a fiscal intermediary for consumer-directed personal assistance, as well as some other um, self-direction programs. Our biggest program by far is consumer-directed personal assistance. It is what I'm going to talk most about um, today. It's a Medicaid program as we mentioned before, so you have to have Medicaid to use it. Another program that we do, it was mentioned earlier by Al, is uh, Consumer Directed ISEP. It is funded by aging and the counties, and it is administered by the counties. Uh, it is for people who need some home care, but they are not eligible for Medicaid. And then the final program that we uh, administer is a Consumer Directed Respite Program for people who are caregivers of loved ones, trying to keep people with Alzheimer's and other dementias at home. Um, that is administered by the Eddie Alzheimer's Services here in uh, Cohoes. So some basics about CDPA, again, just a real, I, I don't want to assume anybody knows what this is. Uh, in this program, the consumer or their designated representative are the one who controls the home care. It is not an agency. It's not a licensed agency doing it. The consumer and or the DR serves as employer of their home care staff. In CDPAP, it's called the personal assistant or PA. It does have other terms and other programs, but I'll be using the PA in this presentation. And as employer, consumers and designated representatives are solely responsible for recruiting and hiring their workers, training their workers, scheduling their workers, supervising their workers, terminating their workers. In law, CD choices and other fiscal intermediaries cannot engage in these activities. So we do not hire workers, we don't train them or schedule them or supervise them or terminate them. But what we do is we provide supports to consumers in their programs to make sure that they're successful. We're most known for the payroll and benefits administration that we do. We also handle all the financing. So we bill Medicaid and we do the payroll taxes, things like that. And then we also have a responsibility for compliance monitoring to make sure that rules are being followed and we have employer supports. It could be peer mentoring, it could be education, it could be re-education sometimes. Um, we provide information about basic employment laws um, and best practices and uh, we try to provide other resources as well. <clears throat> so the benefits of CDPA, one of the biggest ones is that consumers and DRs can pretty much hire people that they know and trust if that's what they want to do. It can be family, it can be friends, they don't, the personal assistants don't have to have any special certification or special training involved. Um, and, and I want to pause on this a minute because some people think that it is just family that is working as personal assistants. And so everybody thinks of it as it's just family. That's actually false. Um, there are a lot of people who hire family. So just under half of our consumers at City Choices, they employ at least one family member. And so there is a lot of family, but 75% of consumers are actually employing non-family members as well, um, or solely non-family members. And the majority of them, it's people that they never knew before. Um, so one of the things that's good about CDPA is that for a lot of people, it can help 
with the home care shortage because it broadens the pool of potential workers for them to pull from because they can hire family and friends. They don't have to have special certifications. But I also want to be cautious that it's not a panacea. Um, it's, they still do struggle with home care shortages as well, even in CDPA. Another benefit to uh, CDPA is that there is a, there's a dignity that comes from having control over your life. It, it fulfills an inherent need that we all have to control our lives, um, control what we do, when we do it, who we do it with, how. Even if it's as simple as getting out of bed, getting dressed, having that control leads to a feeling of self-worth and dignity. It can match cultural um, backgrounds. So for people who are from certain cultural backgrounds that feel more comfortable with people with similar cultures, they can recruit within their own communities. And I'm gonna throw this out there. I have no data to back this up, but I am making a guess that um, we, after this pandemic is over, that uh, home care and maybe even CDPA in particular may be um, a way to improve, help people improve their own protections against contagions. It's not 100%, it's not risk-free, but they may be able to do better um, if they're home rather than in a congregate facility. So there are challenges though with it. Um, and the big one is inadequate funding and, and, and this by the state and managed care plans. Um, Al talked about it, uh, Nora talked about it. And as a result, you have worker wages that are low and, and it contributes to those shortages. And um, hopefully at some point that changes. A big thing that is um, problematic with this program or a challenge with the program, I shouldn't say problematic, it's a challenge, is that it's not a program for everyone. So if there's anybody on this webinar who is from a um, managed long-term care plan or a county, um, this is not a program that should be a last resort program for um, if you're desperate. It can work in, in a lot of situations for people who are self-directing or they have a designated representative who's going to be self-directing. Too often, I will say that we do get uh, referrals coming in from uh, plans or counties where it is a person with like Alzheimer's or a dementia and they're coming at us as though they're self-directing. And when we go back to the plan and we say, this person's not self-directing, we sometimes hear back, oh, well, don't worry, the adult daughter is gonna be the personal assistant and she's gonna run everything. And I'm gonna tell you that is a no-no. That is an absolute no-no because the fiscal intermediaries are not supervising care and we are not supervising the workers. And so you cannot have a designated representative being a worker and you cannot have a worker acting as a designated representative. There are, those roles are defined in regulation. They are divine, defined in regulation for a very specific purpose. And those roles and responsibilities need to be respected and they need to be appreciated and they need to be separated. If they're not, you run the risk of, you know, that's where they run the risk of frauds or any problems that you have with compliance um, in those situations. So what's, so what's sometimes challenging is really having people understand what does self-direction mean? and understanding really what the program is about. There's also a lot of misconceptions and negative attitudes about the program. I mentioned before that people think that this is just, oh, it's just family members, just family members being hired. I just showed you that that's actually not true. These are people who are hiring also family members, but also pe other people. Um, so it's about two minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing is that with state budget constraints, one of, over the last few years, there has been huge growths in uh, the program across the state. I can go into depth about why that is the case. However, it has caused stress on the state budget. We were cited as one of the reasons why there was that $6 billion hole. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the self-direction with COVID. Um, I have been fascinated to see how consumers have been responding and keeping themselves protected in COVID. It is, we have taken surveys in this and uh, it's been really interesting. So one of the things that we are hearing from our consumers is that they are struggling with PPP, PPE shortages and price increases. We've been trying to help them out by trying to give them access to more of that PPE stuff, but um, it has been a struggle. But it's really interesting to see what they've been doing to keep themselves protected. And I think it's really an idea that consumer direction can work. And, it, and it's, it's an example of, I think, of a success 
of the program. So a lot of consumers, they are, they are enhancing and reinforcing their infection infection control policies at home. They're retraining their workers. They're making sure that they're following those good practices. They are also implementing strict symptom um, policies. So if anybody has a sniffle or something, they're not letting them come to work. We're also finding that about 20% of our consumers, a little more than that, actually are doing their own so-called furloughs. They're reducing the staff that are being scheduled um, in order to reduce the number of people they're coming into contact with. It's actually a very understandable reaction. Um, their service level is not going down. They're using the same amount of hours. What's, what we're finding is that there's an increase in overtime. That creates a strain just because we don't get funded for that. We are finding that some people have an increased need in um, services because day programs have been suspended. So that's been a challenge for them. And again, we, have, we don't know what the infection rate is among COVID, among uh, self-directed home care populations, but we are, I am wondering if it would be better than what we'd see in like a nursing home. So um, in the future, happening is last, last year, the, what it felt like an assault on the consumer protected program. In last year's budget, the state started to try an effort to reduce uh, fiscal intermediaries. There's like 600 of them across New York State. We are in the process of going through an RFO process. That affects people because if they're in a fiscal intermediary that's not, uh, uh, that's not selected, they have to find another fiscal intermediary and to try making that transition smooth. We have the eligibility changes that were talked about. Um, there is an assessment, an additional assessment for high hour folks. That scares me. I'm afraid of institutionalization that will be forced on people as a result of that. Um, we have unsustainable budget cuts that we're facing. Nora and Al talked about those. Um, some of them are pretty scary. And then we have what I see as the devaluation of home care workers. There was a time when personal assistance could earn more than minimum wage. And um, between the rising minimum wage and then the, and then the government stagnating funding or sometimes reducing funding, uh, we've devalued them into minimum wage jobs. And then that of course aggravates the home care shortage. So. Thank you, Elizabeth. My last one. Fascinating. Uh, in the in New York State parlance, and I've been kind of involved, I was on the governor's task force on long-term care reform in 1996, which is mm -hmm. really one of the things that, that created this forum. And the woodworking effect is something that budget directors talk about, because if you build a program that's too good, a lot of people will come out of the woodwork, literally, and use the program. And I think in some ways, consumer directed is a victim of its own success because it has filled a necessary and essential gap where the agency care has not been able to keep pace with the need of consumers in the marketplace. And Absolutely. it started with people with disabilities. Uh, we had Constance Lehman as part of this program for years, who was one of the originators of the local consumer directed agency. Constance in a wheelchair was running her own agency and, and ultimately got herself off Medicaid but it's so necessary for people who are cognizant and can self-direct to have the ability to hire and manage their own staff. Um, the funding issues, we're all gonna be fighting those up and down the line. Consumer Directed mm -hmm. got swept in that. And it's a, it's a very, very difficult situation for families trying to balance the budget, find the care, pay people enough money, because a going wage for a home health aid in the private market, we all know there's an underground economy out there. There are aides that are going job to job when someone dies. They stay with that person for a lifetime and then they move on when the person dies and they're paid in a lot of ways that are not part of this whole thing. So Al's percentages of where the money comes from and only 4% being private pay, that's way low because there are a lot of people paying out of pocket for people that they find on their own that are just good caregivers that they bring into the home. So. A lot of work needs to be done there. We're going to have some questions and we are going to run a little bit long. So I just want to let everyone know that because we do have some questions lined up. And I want to bring on our next speaker. Uh, Nadia is going to come on, Nadia Argentina from the uh, from NYSARC, <laughs> NYSARC Trust Services. And when people have disabilities, we use special needs trusts for them. In New York, we have a unique situation where a special needs trust can be used for someone over age 65. Do you know how much money you can keep at home in income? About $895 per month. How do you exist and how do you live at home? On $895 per month, you don't. 
Nadia, tell us how it's done. Great, thanks, Lou. Very happy to virtually be here and be able to share all this information with you. Um, you know, as Lou said, it's really uh, hard to have a conversation about home care in New York without talking about the financial eligibility piece. Uh, because without being able to access Medicaid services to receive home care, the cost of private paying for these types of services uh, is really well without uh, out of reach for many New Yorkers. So I'm going to talk about uh, the ways to uh, access uh, home care services through Medicaid and in particular how using a pool trust can help an individual be eligible for Medicaid and then also still have funds available to help support them in the community. Uh, so a, sorry, so a pooled supplemental needs trust, as Lou mentioned, is a special type of trust uh, in which a not-for-profit trustee, such as NYSARC Trust Services, holds assets for the benefit of a person with disabilities, and when the money is in the special needs trust, it is not considered available for the purposes of that individual's eligibility for government benefits, and the funds in the trust can be, then be used to improve that individual's quality of life. This is something that is allowable under federal and state law, and in New York in particular, it is something that is allowed to be used to shelter excess income. Uh, once the money is in a special needs trust, that money is available to uh, be used for life enhancing, enhancing purchases that go above and beyond what someone's benefits provide. When we're talking about the uh, Medicaid income and resource limits, these are some of the numbers that we're looking at. Uh, earlier in this presentation, we were talking about the resource limits, uh, and that's where the new look back period that's coming into effect in October is going to come into play. Uh, so people who are making transfers to get below those two resource limits on the slide are going to be potentially subject to that look back period if they don't make those transfers and apply for Medicaid prior to October 1st. But in particular here, I'm gonna be discussing the income portion of uh, Medicaid eligibility. So as you can see on the slide, and as Lou mentioned, for an individual who wants to be eligible for Medicaid services, they can only have $895 a month in income. And I think we all know that across New York State, whether you live up North or down in New York City, $895 really isn't a lot of money to support someone in the community. But if someone wants to receive Medicaid services, they have three options about what they can do with their excess income. They can spend that income over the $895 limit on um, eligible medical expenses. They can pay that excess income to Medicaid or uniquely in New York State, they can put that excess income into a pooled trust and then they will receive be eligible for the Medicaid services and then be able to use that excess income to support themselves in the community. So there are a lot of benefits to using a pooled trust. You know, first and foremost, the benefit is obviously to be able to qualify and maintain eligibility for those community Medicaid services. But perhaps even more important now than ever, one of the other big benefits is that using a pooled trust allows someone to maintain themselves in the community. During the COVID-19 pandemic, I think we've all been well aware of how individuals in nursing homes and other congregate settings have had unique challenges to avoiding the coronavirus. And using a pooled trust is going to help someone be able to maintain themselves in their home, in the community, and get the care that they need Whereas if they were not able to put their excess income into a trust, they wouldn't be able to stay in the community and they'd be forced into a nursing home. The other benefit of using a pooled trust is that those excess funds that they would normally have to pay over to Medicaid, they're able to keep those and use them for life enhancing expenses to maintain their quality of life, uh, even as they're facing medical challenges. A pooled trust can also be a great benefit for someone who needs a transition home after following a short-term rehabilitation stint. And finally, one of the big benefits of a pooled trust is that uh, using a pooled trust to access home care services can be a wonderful relief for family caregivers. It can help get additional caregivers into the home, and it can also help financially allow someone to be able to continue to support themselves, whereas if the family was looking to private pay for services, 
we often see family caregivers having to spend their own money, oftentimes, which they don't have enough of, to pay for caregivers. So this can help the family as a whole. Uh, when, in order to create a pooled trust, all someone needs to do is execute what is called a joinder agreement. That's basically a contract between the individual who wants to participate in the pooled trust and the not-for-profit organization that runs the pooled trust. One of the really great things about these types of programs, beyond the fact that it can help with Medicaid eligibility, is that the not-for-profit organization, like NYSARC, has already drafted the trust and had it approved by the Social Security Administration. So it's very easy to join the trust. Once someone is in the trust, there's a few rules about how the money can and can't be used. Uh, the main rule is that the money in the trust can only be used for the sole benefit of the trust beneficiary. And what that means is that the money can only be used for that individual. It can't be used to buy gifts or services for other people. Disbursements from the trust can only be made to third parties. We can't give the money back to the individual because that would essentially undo the protection that we've worked so hard to create. And the other thing that we always like to point out about pooled trusts is that the account closes when the individual passes away and no other disbursements can be made. Uh, we kind of think, that, think of that as one of the caveats that allows someone to use a pooled trust and essentially have their cake and eat it too by being able to use as their, their excess income to support themselves and enhance their quality of life by also receiving Medicaid services. So under the pooled trust, uh, no disbursements can be made after death, but the money Money then stays with the not-for-profit of other people with disabilities uh, along with the not-for-profit organization's mission. This is a non-exhaustive list of all the things that a pooled trust can pay for. And this is what the trust typically pays for. Uh, it can help pay for rent or a mortgage, utilities, all those expenses that are necessary to keep someone in their home, as well as transportation, groceries, and things like that. But you know, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, I also wanted to point out that there's this money can be used to buy assistive technology. It can be used to buy things like iPads and new cell phones with video technology that will allow families and their loved ones to stay in contact while sheltering in place and being unable to see each other in person. The money can be used to buy PPE and other things that are necessary to keep someone healthy during this ongoing pandemic. And if someone Daddy, only has, thank, you. thank you. And if someone was only able to keep eight hundred and ninety-five dollars a month, they probably wouldn't have excess income. To buy something like a new cell, a, a pool trust can really help enhance someone's quality of life and keep them safe in this ongoing health crisis. Uh, these are a few examples of how it really works to get the money in and out of a trust. Uh, this is commonly how we see people accessing the money. Uh, the number one way is people just submit a bill or a receipt and the trust pays the third party directly. You know, so we pay the mortgage company or the utility company, um, we pay for an insurance premium and that money comes directly from the trust to that third party. We can also reimburse individuals. We can, for example, you know, if a woman is buying groceries for her mother, we can reimburse the daughter for that expense. We also encourage people to use credit cards as much as possible. It's just easier for the family. Um, and particularly with all the challenges happening now, we want to make things as easy as possible. So we can pay someone's credit card bill directly as long as we get a copy of the credit card bill and itemize receipts. And we can also pay a quote or an invoice for a larger service or purchase. We often see this when people are buying assistive technology like a stair lift, which is more expensive and might need to be paid in advance. Uh, this can also be used to make home repairs or maybe home modifications to help someone age in place, uh, like putting rails in their bathroom or maybe lowering kitchen cabinets. So there really is so much more that the trust can pay for than it can't pay for. Uh, and we always encourage people that if you're not sure if it's something the trust can pay for to reach out to the not-for-profit that you're working with and they can help work with you to figure out how to use the money in the trust. Thank you, Nadia. You're welcome.
pool trusts are truly a lifeline and i don't know how someone survives without them in the community oh, absolutely living on community medicaid the big question obviously is october 1 the medicaid law mm -hmm. changes uh as we read it is there a change that you know uh, of to the pool trust use you know most of us in the legal community are interpreting it to still allow for pool trust to be used but i think the big challenge with the changes coming october 1st is that there's so much need for clarification uh, and I know that we're all uh, advocating and waiting to get more information. But like you said, these pool trust services are so important uh, that I can't imagine how New Yorkers would survive without them. Uh, and, and so many more Elizabeth people would be forced into nursing homes. Premature institutional institutionalization before, yeah. and, and that would truly be a result of not being able to use that. To how do you pay rent if you're renting an apartment on exactly. eight hundred ninety-five dollars per month? It just is not realistic. Yeah, and the state couldn't uh, handle more people in nursing homes before COVID-19, and mm -hmm. now it's unimaginable. Uh, it's impossible to social distance there as it is, much less with more residents. So the elder law section of the state bar has a committee that's working on the October 1 changes, and I know the pool trust is one of the top items on their agenda to get clarification yes. that it will still be usable. If all of our other panelists could join us, we'll start with some questions. Um, the cost of home health care we have clients paying $250,000 per year. That's right, $250,000 per year. If you do the math, $30 an hour, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, that's where you get. And so that cost drives people to the alternative financing sources. Um, we have some questions and Beth is going to lead us in that discussion. So Elizabeth, can you say more about additional assessments that are being proposed for high hour folks? Yeah, in the budget, and I believe this starts October 1st, there is supposed to be a separate independent assessor uh, for people who are considered high hour. I forget the amount of hours that they would be um, kind of hitting to, to have to do this, but they'd have to go through yet another assessment to make sure that they can safely remain in the community. And what's scary about it is that there's a dollar savings to it. And when people are high hour people, individually, they can be more expensive than when they're in an institution. Um, but if they can be maintained safely in the community, they wanna be in the community, civil rights, they should be in the community. And what we fear, there's a lot of able, I call it ableism, actually a lot of people call it ableism in out there where there's a lot of people who might look at somebody with a lot of hours and say, well, of course they're gonna be better in a better in a nursing home. They're gonna be safer in a nursing home. How can they manage this? And meanwhile, some of our biggest veterans um, of CDPAP, they've been doing it for decades and they've got 24 hour care and they've got trait care and all this other stuff and they're fine and, they may, and they're happy. And, mm -hmm. and if they were ever in a nursing home, they just deteriorate and die. And so there's this fear, even if it's not meant and done intentionally, that this is going to drive people to end up becoming institutionalized against their will. And that's well, and, and so that's what I'm afraid of. It brings up a broader policy issue, and, and Al maybe can comment on this, but you go back to the MRT1, the Medicaid redesign team, that brought us managed long-term care that was going to accomplish the triple aim of improving care, reducing costs. None of that happened. Costs continued to escalate and the need for home care continued to grow. So the state, Al, and, and I think in the care side of this, in addition to the financial side, is looking to put a tourniquet on the bleeding from home health care. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, well, I, I guess you could you could describe it that way. Uh, you could also uh, and and perhaps also say that uh, you know the, if if we're going to care for people at home and in the community, the appropriate investment has to be made for the services that that individual needs. I mean, any any insurance plan is supposed to be actuarially rated to deliver the product that the insurance uh, company is offering. Uh, the state law requires uh, New York State to actuarially rate the managed long-term care plans but if you if you would recall from the slide that i showed um 50 or 60 percent of those plans are in a negative margin or in a negative premium position the premiums mm -hmm. are not supporting what the services are so here you are now in the new round of budget where the state is not only going to do a 1.5 percent across the board cut which is all the plans and then 
and then streamlines to all the providers, but now adding to that a 3% withhold on managed care plans that are not what are called fully capitated, meaning they don't have all the services in the spectrum, but the long-term right. ones. So imagine the impact of that. The state has already reduced the, the, the allowable reserve levels of the plans, which used to be reimbursed, down to bare bones. Uh, and the state has not even reconciled the 2019 uh, 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 premiums for these plans. At the same time, right. The state, since going back to even 2018, has not made the the uh, the minimum wage adjustments to home care providers. So if, again, if we if we want a home care plan, it's got to be supported according to the rules of law. Yeah. Okay, Nadia, how long does the pooled trust process typically take, and is a POA required in order to enter slash participate in such? That's a great question. So the application process um really only takes a couple of days i think our biggest hold up is just if we get an incomplete application the information that you need for the joinder agreement i always tell people it's really demographic information as opposed to the medicaid application it's not going to be anything that you're going to need to be diving into your records looking for documents it's probably all information that you have uh so it really only takes a couple days uh in terms of whether you need a power of attorney what you need is you need someone who has the legal authority to sign the joinder agreement on behalf of the individual. That can be the individual themselves if they have capacity, but we do often have uh, agents under power of attorney signing the joinder agreement on behalf of individuals who no longer have the capacity to do it on their own. Uh, so for that, we do need a power of attorney. Um, but you don't need- I just need want to clarify questions. one thing. The, the joinder agreement and getting set up with NYSARC is a snap. But yes. when you apply for Medicaid, it extends the county's time because if you're not already on Social Security disability or some other disability where a determination has been made, the state gets an extra 45 days to make a disability determination. So it actually extends the time for the county to consider the application from 45 days to 90 days. And that does add to the time requirement to get services turned on in the home. All right, yeah. we have another question. Can anyone speak to the donut hole of services in which people who don't qualify for MCD but do not have the financial resources to privately hire adequate care? Are any initiatives taking place to shrink this gap? I'm going to interpret MCD to mean Medicaid if, if it doesn't post it up in the question. Yep. Um, but there you have the Medicaid world on one side, which is an impoverishment program. And then you have Medicare on the other side, which has cut off any real custodial or, or ongoing chronic care. And then you have this huge gap in the middle. Anybody want to jump in? Uh, I, I have some thoughts, Lou. Um, so right now, one, one initiative that is taking root is an initiative being led by Greg Olson, the commissioner of the state office for aging, looking to create a private, uh, a private pay like a sliding scale model within the expanded in-home services for the elderly program. So within county offices for aging, there's currently state funding that supports the non-Medicaid population, but he's trying to expand that and with the income generated, make that a recurring reinvestment, which I think is, is very innovative. But when you look at the size of the whole, the size of the need is extraordinary. Just going back to the 1980s and the mid 80s, uh, the, when the state was looking at at, at uh, the Medicaid long-term care financing issue, it really punted uh, when it looked at the private uh, financing options and then created the, the ICEP program way back then as a starter model. Well, here we are 40 years later uh, and we're building on that, but we've, we've lost the 40 years time of a real look and investment to try to encourage a mainstream coverage for long-term care. Well, if you go back to the governor's task force in 1996 and i think i'm not sure where you were then but i know you were part of that uh, in those discussions we looked at long-term care insurance and the industry the insurance industry was promoting long-term care insurance and did it very powerfully as the solution to fill this gap and, and it was a short-sighted solution new york was actually on the cutting edge of that with the partnership for long-term care which was an extremely innovative program at the time which combined long-term care insurance with Medicaid, a public and private financing partnership 
that worked tremendously well until the policies got too expensive to be viable in New York State. June 4th, we have Bob Bandy, who's been doing this a long time, who's going to talk about private insurance options and innovations in the marketplace. But Al, we've talked a number of times about a concept that the Bar Association actually brought to the table with Gail Halabinka called the Compact for Long-Term Care, which was exactly the program to take care of this middle ground and to fill that donut hole. But we got it passed in the Senate 10 years ago, 12 years ago, never got any action in the assembly and uh, it didn't make it. All right, I got one for Elizabeth. Will the changes being made to CDPAP apply to new Medicaid applicants where the Medicaid application is submitted after October 1st, or could it apply to a Medicaid mm -hmm. recipient who has not enrolled in an in, in MLTC as of October 1st? For example, applicant is approved for immediate need Medicaid September 1st, but in the process of enrolling in an MLTC. I don't think we know that. Um, the eligibility changes are basically just, they just say that they start October 1st. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has been assessed as eligible for PPAP or PCA services prior to October 1st, like in September under immediate need, I'm going to assume that they would be okay for October. Now, would they be eligible to be enrolling into a, will the, will the managed care changes in terms of the eligibility impact them at that point because they're not in there yet? That's, I don't know if maybe even Al knows if, if that's would affect them. Like if they're already kind of in the process of starting to get enrolled in managed care and, but it's September, um, would they come up against October with the new eligibility changes if they have not yet enrolled in managed care? I don't know if you know that. I, I don't think I've seen in the language that specifies that. Yeah, I don't think it's been detailed as yet. And and uh, the other the other issue is is that if you're in and then let's say you have you cycle out and come back in, I don't think that that's been evaluated either. I think also with these reassessments and panels, um, I think I would think at the next time of your reassessment, you're going to bump up against a, a more rigorous review of your need. I don't think they'll change the underlying eligibility, but uh, but certainly a more rigorous review of your need. So next Friday, we have the chairs of the New York State Senate and Assembly Aging Committees who are going to be with us from 8.30 to 9.30. And then we have Greg Olson and hopefully Mark Kissinger from 9.30 to 10.30. The Bar Association has been asking the state for clarification. The state has been conspicuously silent. They have not spoken yet. And these are all of the issues, the gray areas of interpretation that are still left to be answered in terms of the October 1 start date. It does say applications filed on or after. So the loose interpretation of that until we get better guidance is if you're in the process, you should be you should be judged under existing law. If you're filing on or after October 1, that's going to bring in the new rules, but we don't know that for certain. Beth, any more questions? Howdy, uh, how does a pool trust work for a married couple with dual incomes if only one of them is in need of Medicaid? Well, that's going to depend on how that married couple handles their Medicaid application. Uh, but the trust is going to be for the individual who has the spend down. So if only one of those couples is needing Medicaid, they're going to be the one assessed with the spend down. And they're probably going to want to go see an attorney like Lou or someone else who can help make sure that when they apply for Medicaid, they're accessing the most favorable budgeting possible for their family. Yeah, the, the spousal impoverishment budgeting rules is what you want to target. So the Medicaid applicant spouse can put all of their income into the pool trust and above the exempt level. The spouse in the community, I believe the number is around $3,200 a month now that they could keep, uh, I believe, of their own income at the time. And spousal refusal survived yet again. They have tried to take spousal refusal out of the system for 27 years in a row, and they've failed 27 years in a row. So if the spouse has, say, 5,000 a month of income, the healthy spouse, they can file a spousal refusal and keep that $5,000 per month. You do that along with the Medicaid application. You have to be ready for the pushback. But what the law says is that the well spouse has to give a voluntary contribution. There's no mandatory contribution for the spouse's, the well spouse's own income. 
But in New York, there was a negotiated settlement with the State Department of Health many years ago for a 25% voluntary contribution. So for example, if you're 2000 over the eligible income for a community spouse, you'd be asked to contribute $500 toward the cost of care. So those are complex rules. And you know, people ask, do you need an attorney to file a Medicaid application? Certainly if there are resources and income above the limits, you should get guidance and get counsel from a qualified attorney. Well, we do have one for Al here. Uh, can you speak to the impact on consumers of that new look back of two and a half years and the elimination of Medicaid home care for people with only one or two needs, ADLs? Will home care agencies create private pay plans for those in need? Well, first, I, I don't think it, it's the elimination of the uh, it's the elimination of any home care. Um, I think that it's the qualification for services under consumer directed, under managed long term care. Um, Medicaid recipients are all Medicaid recipients are required by New York to enroll in a managed care program and, and that includes what's called mainstream managed care which can offer some personal care services but i will tell you i don't think plus there are the waiver programs there's the that i mentioned in my slides uh, i don't think the state's plan has been articulated for individuals that don't meet th th those eligibility thresholds those are just some areas where coverage could continue uh, I, I think that that's a real concern on the part of consumers. It's certainly a big concern on the part of our association in terms of how people are going to receive services and coverage when these changes take place. There's no plan that we know of at this point, though there should be, to sort of couple this with, with some ability to expand what we're covering in a, in a private scenario. It should really be done. So, Nora, this is... This is why geriatric care management exists, is really to give families guidance on how to navigate between these very disparate systems. You know, the private pay system, the Medicaid system, the Medicare benefits, it's tremendously complex. So you're, you're a frontline worker, you're putting on PPE and going into people's homes to guide them through these situations. What are you seeing, how are families dealing with that? I'm really seeing the stress level um, unbelievably um, being very difficult, leading to, you know, relationship issues with with other family members. Um, you know, the PPE we mentioned is very hard to get. I've had to go and get masks for, for um, you know, people, especially because those that have, um, that do not have um, uh, agency, but they've hired privately, um, you know, as Elizabeth mentioned, have to do the PPE and the infection control. So there was a lot of education that, uh, you know, Sue and I had to do. Um, and then the impact on not being able to visit loved ones in the nursing home and being confined um, of the clients that I have, uh, the, the significant De, uh, deterioration and depression and, um, you know, not eating, losing weight. Um, it's all really magnified everything. And I just don't see, um, you know, with this um, pandemic and it's long term, you know, what they're talking about, this is going to be, um, you know, years and going in. Um, I don't see how families are going to survive so that advocacy is um crucial and you know being proactive if there's ever a, a thing that i can say a shout out it's being proactive and looking at addressing care needs early and still okay. people and are doing that at the last minute Last year, we had a technology panel that involved Keith Algazine with United Concierge Medicine. Uh, and UCM has just blown up since last year with the COVID crisis, especially. But back in the fall, they did a pilot project with Rensselaer County showing the effect of telemedicine on the cost of care in terms of overall health care. And their results in Rensselaer County were that they reduced hospital admissions 97%. You can get the study uh, from either Keith Algazine or from the, the Department of Health. And those are Medicaid patients. CDPHP was a participant in that. And after the COVID crisis hit, CDPHP picked up telemedicine now. So everybody 
with CDPHP or even MVP has telemedicine available to them, a virtual emergency room in your own home. The technology also includes things like e-caring, uh, which we had Robert Herzog demonstrate last year, which is a tablet technology to monitor and track care, alarm.com's wellness program. So technology is available as a low cost solution to provide information, monitoring of care, and to supplement the hands-on care that may ultimately be necessary. So if there is any bright light on the horizon, it's that technological solutions will be available to us on an increasing basis and, and hopefully we'll be able to bridge this gap that we have in the necessary care for individuals. Any other Thank questions, you. Beth? Well, there are more questions, but should we direct them afterwards by email or keep going? Let's do one more. Okay. Al, <laughs> are there executive orders that home care agencies should require two negative COVID tests for people coming home to utilize their services? So um, there, there are the executive order currently applies to uh, to nursing home and adult care facilities. Um, the, the the there is a clarifying um, uh, uh, question and answer document that the department filed, which indicates that those um, those tests do not apply to home care personnel. Um, or earlier in the COVID uh, response, uh, the department put, uh, put out guidance that requires uh, uh, workers to uh, self-test for their symptoms every day, including temperature, um, and to report that. And then there's a protocol that, that is put in place if the, if the individual is, is triggering, you know, uh, uh, any of those thresholds. You know, one of the big differences between testing in a congregate place like a nursing home and home is, is that in the home care environment, the person the, the person's not reporting to the office per se, where they're engaged in a, in a pre-screen by the office, they're going to the home of the patient. Uh, you know, and and the 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 extent of the potential disruption, not only in the and and the with in the timing of the service, but in the accessibility of the service, is very profound. So it becomes a balancing act. The major focus really is on the whole issue of protective equipment and taking universal precautions and infection control so that every case is handled regardless of whether it's hepatitis or COVID or anything, every case is handled as a potential uh, 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 opportunistic situation for the transmission of some transmissible disease. And so you take those steps up front uh, uh, with every case. So uh, one of the struggles as we've talked about has been in PPE, Nora was just talking about that. That's something that is, you know, is improving, but is still outstanding. We've asked the state to take greater steps in trying to support access to PPE and also, you know, the, the monitoring of our own personnel, our own workforce. Yeah, unfortunately, that's become a political football as well. Yes. And uh, politics has worked its way into the COVID crisis, which is very unfortunate, but that's the reality of the situation. We are going to take one more question. Thank you for staying with us and, and spending some extra time. Beth? I'm sorry we can't get to all the questions, but... So with the changes to Medicaid, will that rule out people who have a mental health DX who really do not have a need with ADLs, but more for I ADLs? Will they lose home care service? Okay, uh, that's a good question. That gets into the cognitive criteria for, under the new rules. Um, anyone want to <laughs> tackle that? Well, there's an, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly I'll yield to, to Elizabeth or, or Nora or, or Nadia, but 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 there there's a different standard for individuals that are determined to have dementia. But dementia is not necessarily a secondary diagnosis of of either a behavioral health issue or certainly a psychiatric diagnosis. So I, I don't know that it's really clear how all that's going to be handled. I think that that falls into that gray area of you know, what does the state really have in mind? I mean, we don't even know what the level of compromise of an ADL is under the two ADL plus standard. Is it that you is that you need total assistance, substantial assistance, partial assistance, and how is that measured? Again, putting my hat back on all the way back to the 80s, this was a very serious situation in the city of New York uh, and with some local districts who were applying standards of need well beyond what was a practical application. So if you could crawl into the bathroom and get on the toilet, could you transfer or could you not? You know, and, and it really comes down to that level of distinction. But again, I'll yield to Elizabeth and or anyone else. 
Well, I think Al, what you said things is- things that we're concerned about, it depends on how they implement it in the end. Right. That's- and, Well, no, that's okay. But the, the thing is, you know, a lot of people have the comorbid conditions and a lot of people have mental health and they also have, uh, some have the developmental disabilities. I mean, you can't, every individual is unique and, you know, you can't use that fragmented approach. You need a holistic, integrated approach. And I think that they're even finding this out with um, the, the health homes. They don't fit nicely into one health home, um, you know, so I really don't know. I think we have to wait and see um, how they're going to further define um, their, their terms. The def it's all in the definitions. Well, I just want to say as an association, we, we maintain a very proactive posture. That's our identity. So we will be taking our concerns and our input to the department. I mean, and, and you know, I would say the department has, has generally been very open to the discussion and to the edification of all this process. So again, we're hopeful that along the way, we'll be able to shape this in, in, a, in a manner that minimizes, mitigates any impact. But we will be sort of taking taking our message and our, our input and our expertise from our, our member community that includes folks like Elizabeth um, to the table, you know? So that's what we'll be doing. I wanna, normally I would ask for a round of applause right now, but I don't know that anyone could hear the applause. Thank you to our panelists. It's been a, a phenomenal discussion and, and our first panel as well. Um, this is a brave new world for our first virtual elder law forum. I wanna thank you all for joining us and staying with us. We've spent an extra half hour. I uh, kind of thought we might, we could probably talk for more hours but I'm gonna end it here. If you've asked a question that hasn't been answered, we will get it to the appropriate individual and answer it by email. So we will respond to your questions by email uh, and thank our panelists and our sponsors for making the Virtual Elder Law Forum a reality. We have two more sessions. Uh, next week, again, we have four legislators, chairs of this, the aging and Senate, uh, aging, aging committees in the Senate and Assembly, along with our own John McDonald, and Stephen Stern, my good friend and fellow elder law attorney. And so we're gonna be talking about the legislative issues and then Greg Olson, hopefully Mark Kissinger, talking about the other regulatory issues. And the, for the first time, State Office for Aging has been funded well. They got a good chunk of money, both from state and federal governments. Uh, and so they have some innovative programs that Greg's gonna talk about that I think are very, very exciting. And the following week, we're gonna talk again about finances, that insurance issue, long-term care insurance, uh, financial planning, how do you solve the riddle to pay for care if you need it, and how do you protect yourself from financial elder abuse? Thank you again. Um, we hope you can join us next week. Thank our panel, and we'll see you at 8.30 a.m. on the 29th of May. Thank you. Thank you.